Welcome to episode 11 of the Progression Health Podcast. I'm here with Sinead Crow of the uh, Intuitive Eating Ireland Instagram account. Sinead, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Um, so yeah, as you said, Sinead Crow, and I suppose I'm in Intuitive Eating Ireland, or one half of Intuitive Eating Ireland, I should say. The other half is my sister, um, Gillian. So um, yeah, I suppose this is what I do in my spare time, it's my passion. It's what I love to talk about. Um, obviously, intuitive eating and diet culture and all that goes with it. But I don't do this full time. I work full time as a clinical nurse specialist in perinatal mental health. So I work here in the hospital here in Galway. And um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. I suppose I work. I, I trained nutritional therapy a good few years ago as well after I'd done my nursing and um finished my postgrad, et cetera. So I went back and studied nutrition, but sure, I'll probably tell you a little bit about that as I as we weave that into the conversation. But um, yeah, so I don't know. Do you want me to elaborate on any of that? <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. That you, So you do perinatal nutrition, is that right? Or are you a perinatal nurse? Yeah, so it's perinatal mental health. So basically I work with women that are pregnant, so expecting, obviously, and uh, into the postnatal period, or women that are, are trying to conceive and are experiencing mental health issues. Um, the service has just taken off, really, in the last couple of years, so it's quite a new service, so there's a lot. We actually only got our team kind of established very recently, so it's all new, and I'm delighted to be a part of it, and uh, women really need this service because it's a particularly difficult and vulnerable time for so many reasons, so it's great to have a specialist team to provide support to women, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't even know, like I just saw recently on Facebook, there was a post about Jigsaw, the mental health service in Galway and how they have a waiting list of something like, I don't know, is it 12 or 20 weeks, something crazy. So it's interesting mm. that there's a service for, uh, for women uh, for their mental health during pregnancy. So yeah, how did that yeah well, about? I think it's, well, you see, the, with, with Jigsaw, and it, and it is, of course, they've got, they definitely have a waiting list because Jigsaw would kind of deal with like mild to moderate mental health issues. Um, and it just means that because like so many people can experience like low mood and anxiety or social anxiety or whatever it might be, and it might not necessarily manifest into a moderate or a severe mental illness, which is what the mental health services are geared towards. They're geared towards more um, moderate to severe. So that's what we would provide a, the, the service for people that maybe would, would meet the criteria for that. Um, so I think what happens is the because there's less services for people that uh, n like meet the, the mild criteria, which actually if, if there was more services, it would likely be preventative of people moving into the more moderate, um, you know, category. So, yeah, it's, it's there are unfortunately a huge waiting lists and in most of the counselling supportive services across across the nation, really. And Jigsaw is just one of them. And you know, there 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 are some fantastic services, but um, is sometimes you'll be waiting quite a while, which is not what you need when you have an underlying mental health issue and you're you're struggling daily. You know, it's not easy. So, if anyone's looking for a job, in all seriousness, you know, you could get into mental health and you could actually find a career in mental health if there's a shortage. Of, uh, there's of there's always always going to be a need for people that are, are um, professionals that are going to be providing support for mental health. Actually, it's a career that I, I like. If I ever meet anybody that's kind of coming close to the leaving cert, I'm like, consider mental health nurse, and it's actually a fantastic career. It's, I'm so delighted I did choose it. You know, so yeah, pl plug for the mental health nurses. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it's very important. I'm only realizing it now as I get older. I wish I looked after mental health more when I was younger, but I guess better late than ever. Yeah. Um, so what led you to being a mental health nurse? What was, you know, the kind of the initial yeah. kind of point there? Well, you know, it's funny, like truth be told, I, I had a, well, I had a child quite young. I was, I, I went into to do forensic science when I was about 18 and I ditched that after about three months and fell pregnant. Um, so I was quite young. I was about, I think, 19 or 20, having my eldest is 17 now. And um, and I, I quit quit college at that point. And I kind of worked for a couple of years as a care assistant to the regional. So I was there. And um, yeah, long story short, I applied for nursing. I actually applied for general nursing, but through my leave insert points. But I didn't have enough points for the general nursing. And at the time, mental health was a bit lower. I think it was like 20 or 30 points lower. So I got through, um, that's how I got into mental health. But I mean, 
the universe has your back, right? Because I would not make a great general nurse. <laughs> I make a much better mental health nurse. So it all happened for, for the right reasons. That's how I got into it. And yeah, don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. Wow, that's that's amazing. Um, so mm. that was a couple of years ago. So there was obviously uh, a need for mental health services back then if the course was offered um, oh, as an yeah. alternative to general nursing. Yeah. So like, I mean, I went, I trained in 2006. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, the, like the, 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 the degree program is out way before my time. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, I suppose maybe pe- more people are hearing about it now because the conversation is, is, has become more widespread that people are talking about mental health and it's maybe a career people are considering, but yeah, I mean, mental health nursing is around for decades. And did you specialize then in the, the perinatal uh, mental health yeah. or was it general? Yeah, so I specialized then I went on to do a postgraduate in inpatient and community. And um, so basically, like when you the way it works is then you can apply for various different posts. And one of them is a clinical nurse specialist once you have the experience and the postgrad, et cetera. And then you have to do specific modules in, in perinatal and mental health. And I have to do additional training in that area. So that's all part of my current role. It's it's constant professional development in a way it doesn't really end you know you're always trying to keep up with the latest research and all the rest of it so mm. very good okay um and then what kind of have you you studied like what are some of the topics you've looked at around maybe like more general mental health because i i don't know how many people are pregnant that'll be listening to this but you know or even something yeah. that people could look out for um you know if a loved one is pregnant or that you know they become pregnant themselves yeah. So do you mean like in terms of like, what are the symptoms or worrying maybe? Um, yeah. I mean, like, you know, like it can be so difficult really to, it's often not like any one, any one thing, you know, and sometimes it can evolve over, over a period of time, but of course, like, you know, a change in, in your mood or maybe not having the same interest in things or maybe being a bit more irritable than usual, maybe not wanting to go out a whole pile, not wanting to meet friends, not having interest in things that you maybe once enjoyed. It could be no, no longer wanting to go to the gym, no longer wanting to go out meeting friends. Your sleep disrupted, you know, sleep is one of the first things to go when it comes to our mental health. You know, appetite, not having the same appetite or maybe seeking comfort in food all of the time. You know, it could be, um, you know, tearfulness. It just can be anx- symptoms of anxiety. So it could be like chest pain, chest palpitations, sweating, you know, and like, you know, for anybody listening, don't get alarmed if you've experienced some of them symptoms. I mean, when you go through various things in life, whether it's a relationship breakup or a change of job, you know, it's normal to experience certain symptoms. But when they're persistent over time, if they're there for a number of weeks, you know, on end, uh, it's likely a sign that there's something going on and that you, you know, deserving of some support with that. Um yeah. And I mean, like, you know, of course, in this different, you know, there's like family history. So genetics, you can be predisposed to certain uh, mental illnesses such as depression, you know, bipolar, um, et cetera. You know, you can get into that. You, I could get into that a bit more. But I think, you know, in terms of the vast majority of people would be experiencing likely kind of mild mental health issues, you know, like I've kind of mentioned there. But still, it's important not to minimize by this, using the word mild as if it mildly affects you it can actually affect you in many ways and it's still deserving and of, of support and help because it's actually preventative so that it doesn't emerge into something more more sinister and serious and more difficult to treat so it's always wise if you notice you know just that dip in mood I, I think it's always helpful to you know gauge where you're at like rate your mood out of 10 each day and notice if you see it's consistently deteriorating you know if 10 is the best you've ever felt and zero is the worst you know, if you're always in and around six or seven or eight, great. But if you start heading down towards three or two or one and it's at that for a while, you know, it's time to do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think just in my own thought of, of pregnancy, I would say, oh, sure, it will be an amazing time in a woman's life, like one of the, the happiest times. But then when you think, when I think a little bit more, it's like you could be very isolated. You could be, you know, easily very stressed. So it's almost like you're extremely vulnerable to mental health issues. Is that fair to say? Because you could be, you know, as we get older, you hear people, oh, I, I, t- people typically tend to exercise less and they become more isolated, especially with the pandemic and technology and stuff like that. Yeah. So like, what's the rate of mental health issues around pregnancy? Is it higher or compared to the general population of women, we'll say? 
Yeah, so about one in four will need some support for their mental health, women that are expecting, you know, and it's um, it's totally understandable too because there comes, like a lot of women, we know also fertility and conception and miscarriages and so much happens around pregnancy that can be incredibly um, challenging and difficult. So I think it's also very normal that there will be a lot of anxiety because of course you want the pregnancy to be hel- healthy and then you also don't know how you're going to cope maybe when baby comes if it's your first baby or you know it depends on your social support so yeah like roughly one in four women that come through the department to deliver will require our input at some point so yeah it's quite high 25 percent yeah all right and then um how does it kind of typically go like do they get a couple of sessions um one-to-one and then like once the pregnancy is over they continue a few more like i guess when do people typically come in and how does the whole procedure work yeah, so you can be referred at any point. So you could come in through your GP. So you might be at one of your GP visits and your GP refers you, or you could be coming in through like your booking visit. So you're coming into your hospital for your antenatal visit or in to see your midwife. And you might tell them, you know, I'm really not doing good. And they will refer into us and we'll pick it up and get you seen as soon as possible. And it depends where you're at. Like some women might be, you know, in around the 16 week mark or the 20 week mark. And, you know, we, we, we will likely if they need it and they want to support them throughout the pregnancy and delivery. And we go down and meet them when they've had their baby on the ward. If it's maybe not a weekend because we, we're not there Saturday and Sunday. But if it's Monday to Friday, we go and see them and see how they're doing and monitor them postnatally. And then. When they go home, um, there's still a service there for up to a year postnatal. So because, of course, like we know that it's not just immediately after the baby that like, you know, issues can arise a couple of weeks, a couple of months into having a baby. So that support can go on for really as long as that woman needs up to a year postnatal. And then it's not like they're left in the lurch after that. If somebody still requires input after the year um, they could still get some support from the community mental health team. They could be referred on then to their own um, community mental health team at that point. So it's not like the door is closed after a year. It just might mean you move into a different service. Yeah, you could need support at any time because you don't know how things are going to go. Um, exactly. Yeah. I'm thinking of two questions. So it's like, let's say you, you, you meet 10 women who are pregnant. How many of them would you typically recommend get kind of like mental health support? Like, would you say every woman should get it? or uh, is it like, you know, one in two or something or, you know, one in one in four, as you said, it's statistics there. Yeah, I mean, I'm careful to maybe give too much on that because, well, first of all, I'm only in the role actually quite relatively new. I'm only in it a couple of weeks, so or a couple of months. So I'm getting my head around a lot of it. But I think sometimes a lot of women just need that initial assessment where I will meet them and we'll talk about what they're feeling. And I've met a lot of women that after one session of just being validated and just being reassured and just being heard and normalize some of the anxiety and remind them their body is so super smart and they will find their way through it. Sometimes that reassurance is enough and they come out going, okay, I'm actually okay now. Thank you. And I might follow up with a phone call or whatever. Like that has happened. And then you also obviously meet the women that you know when you meet them that there's high level ang- levels of anxiety. They might be quite flat, you know, they're, they're not smiling in the assessment. They're quite down, you know, it's, it's not even so much sometimes about what somebody is saying. It's about their, their nonverbal cues, like, you know, the way, the way they're interacting with you, their eye contact, the way they hold their head. So there's lots of different signs that would be indicative of us for us to decide, you know, look, we're going to keep linked in with you and will offer them some su- supportive counseling sessions or whatever. But obviously that's if they want that, some women might not want that and that's okay too. Interesting. So would it be fair to say a psychologist would be general or like a, or a counselor would be general in terms of their expertise, whereas you are more specialized to the pregnancy itself or could a woman go to like a psychologist or a, a counselor or how does that yeah. work? Yeah, we've got a psychologist on the team. She's on maternity leave at the moment. So it depends what shows up. I mean, if somebody's had a birth trauma and something has been quite significant in terms of the psychological impact, uh, they very well might need a psychologist to do that work. You know, um, we have to be very careful about trauma work. You have to be an expert in that area. You have to have done the training. I'm not a trauma therapist in any shape or form, so I don't do not do that work. I am trained in DBT, that's dialectical behavioral therapy. So what I like to look at with people, I don't know if you've heard that before, but 
So a lot of the women that will come in if they've got like emotional dysregulation. So, um, you know, if they're I will do some of the work around that or like the distress tolerance skills, the mindfulness skills, um, their interpersonal effectiveness skills. So they're the kind of skills. That's what I kind of look at. So it's a lot of looking at the behavior. So that's um, that's what I kind of uh, do with my clients. Interesting. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So something I've heard before is of like, is it the post pregnancy blues? Is that is that like is that like a legit? thing that actually happens or is it like it's just of course much rarely than people think or yeah what's the kind of the facts there yeah so like very very normal like usually around day three day four um there'll be potentially a lot of tearfulness or anxiety and you know it could be like women are waiting for their milk to come in because normally they have obviously colostrum when the baby is born but because the baby might be hungry and mooching if they're breastfeeding um, it takes a couple of days for your milk to come in. And of course, if you're stressed, your milk is going to take longer to come in. So a lot of women get quite anxious around day three, waiting for the milk to come in. They might feel a bit down or doubting themselves or doubt, doubting their bodies. And it's like the hormones you've just given birth. I mean, it's a, it's a, it is a trauma to the body, a wonderful trauma in many ways, but it, physiologically a lot happens. So, you know, your your hormones kind of need to reset a little bit and um, it's it can feel very overwhelming. You can feel like, you know, you're not in your own body at all for them kind of two or three days. And um, but a lot of women, obviously, you know, it can be very difficult because they don't know what's going on. And if, you're, if it's your first baby, you don't know what to expect. But for most women, that will subside a couple of days and a bit of reassurance and lots of family support and partner support. Um, but then for some women, it doesn't subside and it stays. And if it's there for longer than kind of your two weeks, if it's been persistent for the two week period, you're definitely looking at something that would warrant more investigation, really, and treatment, et cetera. Yeah, so it sounds like it would be very overwhelming and you could see exactly where your role comes in. You could provide so much support. Um, yeah. So that's a lot of uh, your experience with, with your, your mental health work. What about your work with the uh, intuitive eating page? Can you talk a little bit about like how you, you started that uh, and what initially yeah. led you to setting it? And, yeah. 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 So like myself and Gillian, um, as I said, she's my sister. She's young, like two years younger than me. So we've, we've grown up together. We're very close. We have two other younger sisters as well as four of us in total. And just in a nutshell, we spent like 20 odd years dieting, um, like so many other people. And, you know, in recent years, so like I'm 37 now and um, like kind of as I was heading in, when I kind of turned 30 or, you know, whatever, early 30s, I did begin to we, we got we got fed up with the conversation around dieting. Like we, we even used to say to ourselves, like, this is so boring, like surely we're not going to be spending the rest of our days talking about the next diet we're going to be going on and the next, you know, how much weight we need to lose. And it just got so dull. And like I, I then thought, well, I'll go back and study nutrition. And maybe if I know exactly what I need to eat, that's going to resolve all of my problems. It actually just added to it. I ended up becoming quite orthorexic. So like, you know, obsessed with clean eating, everything had to be organic. Everything was like, I mean, I was robbed blind in, in the health food store because everything was, you know, the, the best of the best. And, um, uh, and not in a healthy way, you know, I couldn't even relax sending my kids to school with some lunches because God forbid they would have been a, like a, a white bread ham, ham and cheese sandwich, you know. So it was just it, it, and it just all became too much. And I think a couple of years ago I had read um, it's not the intuitive eating book, but it's a similar to it. So like a bit similar. It's a, a book by Janine Roth, Women, Food and God. I don't re recommend people read it because it's not that I'm saying it's a really bad book, but it's more like the hunger fullness diet. But so it's not intuitive eating for people. Let's just be clear about that. But like what that book done was, though, it kind of planted this seed in my head that like, oh, so like maybe you could just listen to your body. Like, what would that be like? So we basically myself and Jillian were like, Will we just what we just give this intuitive eating a go? And I I actually bought the book and she one day it fell out of my bag. Like literally, I hadn't said it to her because I thought, like, is this just gonna be another diet that we bond over? Is this just gonna be another, you know, thing that we talk about? So I was like, I'm just gonna do it on my own and just see how I get on. And my the book fell out of my bag and she saw it and she was like, What are you doing? Like, what what are you doing without me? Kind of, you know, because we've done everything together. And I was like, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm, in, I'm an intuitive eater now and that's it. And she was like, well, if you're doing it, I want to do it. So 
that was kind of it. And we kind of looked into like we you'd obviously see lots of resources from the UK and the States. But like I, I, I didn't know anybody in Ireland that was talking about intuitive eating like nobody. Now, obviously, I've, I've since realized that there actually are loads. But when we went when we went looking on Instagram, could find nothing. So we said, why don't we just, um, you know, start up a page at this stage where we're probably. I'd say about eight months or whatever into it when we started the page, which was just at the start of the pandemic last year, March in 2020. Sometimes you forget what year it is, don't you? Yeah, it was March 2020. So, yeah, about like 18 months or whatever it is now at this stage. And um, yeah, we just started obviously documenting uh, our experience and putting up posts and things we were learning and things we were unlearning. And it's just kind of gone from there. And now it's more like obviously I've evolved in the sense that my relationship with food is much better now than what it was 18 months ago. So I probably share less of uh, the struggles that I have because that was more pertinent back then. You know, it, 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 like that's what probably a lot of the people that have been there from the beginning will know that it has changed a bit because of course my experience with it now has changed. But ultimately now I, I it's an information sharing page I try to put as much up there as I can to support people that might not be able to maybe afford an individual therapist which so many people can't because it's financially it's financial privilege to be able to afford a private therapist so yeah I try to put up as much as I can and try and you know get back to people's dms and do the podcast and do whatever I can to get the word out there and that's basically it in a nutshell yeah Brilliant. Yeah, you're doing loads of stuff. I, I saw the amount of content you have. I had like nearly too much stuff to go over with you. Um, but just going <laughs> back to uh, before you started eating intuitively, um, you talked about orthorexia. So what exactly I, I, I've heard of anorexia. I haven't heard of orthorexia. Would you mind talking just a little bit about how challenging it was before intuitive eating, what intuitive eating actually is, and then yeah. how, how it's different now in terms of your relationship with food? Yeah, of course. So like orthorexia is when you become extremely fearful of like what we would typically say is unhealthy. And that's in quote unquote, because I don't like to label any foods, but any foods that diet culture tells us are bad. So like, you know, breads and, you know, sugar and uh, like I became so hyper vigilant of all of these foods. I was like full sure I was just going to like, you know, and I hope some of this content, maybe I should have been putting up a trigger warning for some of this because it, it may be triggering for some people. But like I, I was kind of at the stage where I was full blown sure that I was going to if I was eat, continue to eat sugar, that I was going to have some kind of cancer. Um, you know, I, I it was quite intense, really, um, you know, became like just very rigid around everything having to be absolutely 100% made from scratch. So like no convenience foods at all, nothing from a jar, everything was homemade. And it was just not fun. I mean, I couldn't even go out with the kids for a fucking 99 ice cream because that would have been a non-runner. I would, would have been counting up all the grams of sugar in my head of what would be in the ice cream. So orthorexia is where really where you have an irrational intense fear of certain foods and become quite obsessed with quote unquote clean eating and um it just can really take over your life really and then moving into what intuitive eating is intuitive eating is a lifesaver <laughs> no that's that that sounds dramatic but it but, but it is quite true um well it, you know it, it was it's been true for me so look at I'm just here to share my experience but basically it's a, a framework a self-care kind of I suppose mind body framework that was comprised by two dietitians back in the 90s so it's not new at all by any stretch there's like over 150 evidence-based research studies at the moment to, to like the talk about intuitive eating and the benefits of it and ultimately it's like 10 principles so they're like guiding principles they're not rules you don't start at one and end up at 10 you kind of get your head around them all a little bit as you go all the time. And it's lots of unlearning and relearning. And ultimately it's about coming back into your own body, getting to know what your body wants, what feels good, what foods feel good in your body. All foods are on the table. There's room for all foods at the table. You have unconditional permission to eat all foods. And the irony of it is, is I spent 20 years like, like using every ounce of willpower that I had to not eat certain foods. And the irony is when I gave myself permission to have all these foods, they lost so much appeal. I no longer really gave a shit that I could have. It didn't really, it, the excitement was gone. The adrenaline of, you know, 
flying into the shop and picking up all the chocolate and big, you know, the high, the rush of kind of buying all these quote unquote bad foods. Like it just became food. And that's what intuitive eating does. It just kind of normalizes all foods. It takes takes out all that pressure that kind of it gives you that sense of food freedom. And, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just a way of life really. But I think it's important to say as well that like, I'm, you, there's no end point to being an intuitive eater. Like, you know, you're, you're kind of a practicing intuitive eating for life. Like it's not, you know, I, I don't get any bad now after 18 months and like, you know, it's done. I'm now an intuitive, you know, it, it's just an evolving process. I think all the time, because we're up against diet culture every single minute of the day. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know if you want me to elaborate any more on the principles or what they are, but obviously if people are, you know, hopefully people might be interested in this and if they are ultimately to get your head around it, because we could never cover it in a podcast, it would be, you know, it's important that reading the book and getting an idea of what the principles are, like the first principle is reject the diet mentality. So that's looking at rejecting diets and just look like understanding the research around how actually effective and safe diets are, which really shows that they're not very effective and they're definitely not safe. So it's just looking at all of that, how like, you know, each diet cycle that you go on, like has, you know, I think the the, the last research I looked at was 82% chance of gaining more weight than what you started off at. So like you can, when you imagine the bigger picture of somebody dieting for 20 or 30 years, like every diet they went on increased their set point weight made it much more difficult for their body to find a weight that they, they'd naturally be comfortable at. So, yeah, I don't know if you wanted, if you want me to elaborate on any of that or if you wanted to. Yeah, that's amazing. That's like an unbelievable transformation, I guess. Uh, you were just fed up with everything you tried before and all of this kind of uh, just rubbish, really, of like clean eating that's promoted. It's like it's like the, the dark side of the fitness industry where it's like, you know, you're following a research based evidence-based approach but like this clean eating and dieting like you know dieting is rigid restraint basically where you're trying to you know uh count the calories and you're trying to Mm -hmm. cut out certain things um instead of focusing on your health behaviors which it sounds like you're doing now um so Mm -hmm. i think it's the workbook that i read on intuitive eating i think i think her name is uh it's like evelyn triboli i think her name is it's it's, yeah evelyn triboli yeah it kind of throw you for a loop because it's so anti-diet. You're kind of like, how will this work? And then everything you've just said there really uh, is like what you can experience if you stick with it, you know? Yeah. And like, you know, Evan Triboli is a dietitian that would have, um, and she's amazing. Oh my God. Like I'm doing supervision with her and she's just uh, the, like, wow, she's got so much experience. And like, she would have, you know, had clients, she had the experience of running a clinic and and doing the dieting and recommending the weight loss to her clients. She'd done that for years before herself and Elise Resch, the two of them together, before they came together to say, hold on a minute here, like all of these people are losing weight short term, but they end up coming back the following year, having gained more weight, even though, you know, you've given them a plan and like think it's this simple formula, but they're still coming back. So what's going on here? And they looked into it. And they've like, it's just amazing. Like they have been like, sometimes I'm only like 18 months talking about this, you know, intuitive eating, et cetera. And sometimes I get a bit like, oh my God, is anybody listening? Or when are people going to hear this message? And then I'm like reminding myself that Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch have been banging this drum for like four decades. So um, like, they're amazing. So yeah, I mean, the it can throw you for a loop because it's very, it's radical because we're to- told everywhere. like watch what you eat and and don't eat certain foods and, you know, watch your weight and your weight determines your health. And, you know, because you're hearing that all the time, well, it's, it is radical to kind of question that and, and, and kind of, you know, stick your two fingers up at the diet and be like, I'm done with that. It is, it's totally radical. You're currently working with Evelyn Triboli. Do you want to tell people a little bit about her background and then the work you're doing with her? All right. So sorry, no, maybe I wasn't clear on that. I'm doing supervision with her. So I'm doing the, the, the intuitive eating training with her. So there's kind of four different um, components really of the training. And one of the components is that you have to do supervision with either Evelyn or Elise. And I'm doing mine with Evelyn. And basically, yeah, it's amazing. So like, yeah, as I was just saying earlier, she is the one of the dietitians that put the framework together, this intuitive eating framework together. And um, obviously she's got her own, um, you know, 
training that she's giving out to uh, like offering to uh it's not just dietitians or nutritional therapists you, you can be in a social work background you can be in a um like there's loads of different backgrounds there's kind of a qualification criteria where if you've got a certain um qualification background you can go on to do the training with her it's not just for dietitians and nutritional therapists but i think you know, if you're if you're to go on and, and, and have and see clients, et cetera, I think it would be important to maybe, you know, also expand on and them skills, you know. So, yeah, that's basically what I'm doing. But I'm not finished yet. I'm, I'm hopefully going to be finished probably March next year. I'm just dragging my heels a bit because I'm busy at work and I took kind of the whole summer off and just, yeah, dr- basically just dragging my heels. But anyways. We're in a pandemic, so you're all right. I think if you're going to drag your heels yeah. anytime, it's understandable. Um, I know. So do you want to talk a little bit about like just the whole anti-diet culture? I guess if we just look at the fitness industry and we just say, what are some of the things that are wrong with it in terms of nutrition and diet culture? And then what are some of the solutions that intuitive eating proposes? Yeah. Um, Well, I think like when, okay, so the fitness industry. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't want to shit all over it because there are of course some great parts of it, you know, but I think, one of the biggest things that I would see that I would have had have a huge issue with is that people who do their personal training course or fitness training course, and then they might have a module in nutrition and they might just like hand out, um, like most certainly are not individualized plans in any capacity and, you know, just give the, the calorie deficit and, you know, eat some chicken and rice and broccoli for your dinner and lunch, et cetera. And you lose weight. And um, and that's that's a big problem because, you know, unless you've done the relevant training, you know, it's important that you would be able to screen somebody first and foremost to see what their relationship with food is like. Do you have an understanding if they're already binge eating or secret eating or if they can't eat with their family or if they've got food fears, etc.? There's so many behaviors that would be quite concerning and when you give a diet plan like that without having an understanding of that it's just really incredibly harmful like unfortunately a lot of people like most of my interaction obviously was is with our community and like you know so whatever 20 odd thousand and like I get dms on the daily and unfortunately a lot of people have told me that their their kind of relationship with food um, really deteriorated after they had um, some kind of interaction with a PT. And that's, that's, that's really problematic. Now, am I saying that everybody that goes to a PT and gets a food plan is going to develop disordered eating or an eating disorder? No, I'm not saying that. And I don't think that's the case, but we still don't know who will. And, you know, it's just, that's a problem. So I think, um, yeah, that's the first place I would start. Like, unless you have the relevant qualifications to advise on nutrition i think you need to stay in your own lane and work within your own scope of practice yeah be very careful about the recommendations you make because yeah you, you might have something that worked for you or that you've heard is is good practice but you don't really uh know what someone else is kind of going through what their background or history has been with food and you could be yeah. kind of you could be kind of thrown more fuel to the fire in a sense with some people and they mightn't even know it either do you know yeah totally I mean like also a lot of PTs will have the confirmation bias of the fact that a lot of PTs will have six-pack abs and muscles and you know all the rest of it and because maybe the 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 low carb or the low calorie the death that they they were able to maintain that deficit and, and and achieve that weight loss just because it's worked for you does not mean that it's going to work for everybody else. Because ultimately as well, in many ways, like PTs have the additional stress of having to look a certain way to be in the job that they're in. And they're also in the environment where they could possibly be working out two or three times a day, depending on if they're doing different classes, et cetera. So, you know, you just have to be mindful, I think, of that confirmation bias that just because it worked for you doesn't mean it's going to be the same for everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, that discipline that can get you into good shape as a, uh, a health and fitness professional can actually be your downfall, uh, especially working with clients because yeah. clients are their, their own individuals. Like in their, they are individuals themselves. And uh, I just remember reading in, in research, I was just saying earlier about the, the rigid restraint. So it's like the more you get away from being rigid with food, the better. So I think being flexible and, you know, allowing yourself to have any food really just depending on the portion or just, you know, the context really is is so much more useful than just being uh, disciplined all the time unnecessarily 
um, and worrying excessively, you know? Yeah, of course. I mean, also, I would wonder about a lot of PTs and how they actually feel about their bodies and their relationship with food, because I do think I've also had lots of messages from PTs too to say, you know, I'm actually no longer working in the industry because actually I was quite miserable for the five or 10 years that I was in it because sometimes it can become all consuming and, and, and you can experience a shit ton of stress of having to look a certain way for years on end. That's incredibly stressful. It takes its toll on our, on our mental health. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like the values of the industry are, you sort of inherit them as opposed to yeah. thinking, what do I value or, you know, how do I feel about this standard that's here? Or, you know, what do I want to do as a, as a, as a personal trainer or uh, as a health professional? So yeah, that's very interesting. You wouldn't think personal trainers would be aware enough to come and say, you know, I'm out of the industry, but um, oh yeah, that no, shows I've, how, I've how good the work is that you're doing. Yeah, no, I've met loads. I've met dietitians. I've like interacted with loads of people that have changed, um, you know, their views on that. And um, yeah, it's it's fab to see. I mean, like I did, you know, I'm not here. I'm not here shaming anybody for doing certain things. I done it. I used to see clients for nutritional therapy and I used to recommend keto. I mean, like, you know, I look back on it now and I'm like, you know, I used to recommend keto for mental health and Oh, look, at, there's loads of things that I done that is incredibly problematic, but there's no point in beating myself up over that now. I just have to, you know, I have to move forward and realize that I was doing what I thought was right at that time. But that's the that's the nuts and bolts of it. Like no matter right now in this moment, I'm not an expert in intuitive eating or anything else. None of us are experts in this. We're all I don't believe I certainly don't believe I'm an expert in anything. I'm a student, a student for life. I'm always going to be learning. And I think that's for me, that's the best way to look at it, because, you know, my opinion on some stuff might change in five years time. Let's not get so caught in the black and white. There's always gray. There's always nuance to the conversation. Yeah, that's brilliant to, to continually learn. Um, and speaking of, you know, you work in mental health and I'm sure you come across the black and white thinking a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And you also just talked about like changing your views. So keto is something that I hear so much like, you know, all mm. My friend did this or I heard about that. And um, there is some research to say that it's beneficial, but it's like the, the, the kind of the principles of it, that it's so rigid, like just, you know, they don't check out. So something like keto and then intermittent fasting, what are your opinions on those? I kind of, I can guess what you're going to say, but you tell me because no. we're going from you yeah. know, changing your views. Yeah. How has your view changed really? Well, again, like there, there may be some research that like keto or intermittent fasting, that there may be some benefits of, of fasting. So it's not to say that it's all completely made up and it's all bollocks, right? Like they're, they're, but it's about the bigger picture. Like if you, instead of, I feel like we just, we, we zone in, we need to zone out and look at the bigger picture over the space of a year, two years, three years, five years. And we see how that individual will do intermittent fasting and keto for these years and for majority of people, psychologically, the impact will be like it will be significant. The, the, the impact that 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 kind of rigid dieting and, and um, you know, will have on their uh, on their relationship with food. It's just it can be so toxic and harmful. And that's the truth. You know, I think if some people do keto or intermittent fasting, there probably is a percentage of people that can do it and it, it they're just grand doing it it's not really negatively impacting them but that like I, and I don't have an exact percentage because I obviously have not not conducted any research on this but I would imagine the percentage is teeny tiny like most of us that go down the route of a rigid like clan like that intermittent fast and keto we're headed for trouble because long term we can't sustain it who is going to want to eat salmon and coconut oil forever you know what I mean? Like as in it's just or even intermittent fasting, like the stress. I done intermittent fasting for about two years. And like the truth of it is, is that I might have maintained a certain weight or even lost weight when I wanted to lose weight at certain points. But also it doesn't take into consideration how awful I felt once I kind of would end up binging then once I was allowed to eat within a certain window and would end up eating way more than what my body needed or felt comfortable eating. And I felt awful and the guilt and the shame and then spending days trying to push out my first meal till two or four o'clock in the day, feeling miserable, irritable with the kids, not able to function great, not like doing things that I wanted to be doing. It's not a life. It's just ultimately it's not a life. 
Yeah, I'm just trying to think of how to explain intuitive eating. And it's like, um, you know, breathing is a normal, natural process. And our hunger is a normal, natural process as well. You know, yeah. we breathe faster or slower at different points of the day. And uh, our hunger, you know, uh, goes through high and low periods. So it's like, I guess, would you, would you say it's kind of similar to this? If you were to say to yourself, just randomly, I'm going to hold my breath now for 30 seconds, can't breathe. And then I'm going to take a couple of sharp breaths kind of randomly throughout the day, like you're trying to interrupt a natural process based on this idea that it's better for you. When in actual fact, your body naturally knows when to breathe. You don't even have to think about breathing. And obviously yeah. food's more complicated and much more nuanced than that, but it's similar in that your body will tell you when to eat and when to stop. Is that fair to say? Uh, totally. I mean, Evelyn Triboli uses lovely, brilliant metaphors really. And she uses one like with the breathing and one for like we, and we don't like question needing to go to the bathroom we don't question needing to urinate like we just mm. know that our body knows what to do and it needs to go and the same for breathing and like she says she describes it like something around you know what can happen is like do you know if you were to hold your breath or you were underwater and like the because people will say like that you know you're addicted like you know if let's say certain foods if you've been restricting certain foods and people say oh i'm addicted like once i start eating i can't stop eating it i'm addicted to chocolate and she uses the analogy of like when you're underwater and you can't get a breath and by the time you come to the surface and you take in the biggest inhale and you're kind of gasping, you, you don't just come up and take in small little subtle, you know, uh, subtle pieces of air or whatever. You get up and you're like gasping. And the same is true for food in a way. It's not that you're addicted to air the same way as you're not actually addicted to food. It's that when you've been restricted from something for so long, the minute you get it, your body is just overtakes you and you're like, get it into me. And you can't even eat it mindfully. You're not, it's like an out of body experience. And I don't know if you've ever experienced binge eating. I experienced binge eating for years on and off. And it always, the, the, the number one, I suppose, well, often the number one contributing factor to binge eating is, 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 is restriction. So, you know, you can't, if, if anybody's out there and is binging and I know how distressing it is and how, awful an experience it is and the shame that comes with it and um you know you can't you can't diet your way uh you know out of binge eating there's the the only way really to come through and be and and feel that freedom from binge eating is to stop dieting because that's what's driving it you know for years i just thought well that's you know if only i could eat these foods and you know if i if i was doing certain diets i'd convince myself that if I wasn't having any sugar at all in my system, that might stop the cravings for sugar. No, it didn't. It just drove my cravings psychologically. I was thinking about sugar morning, noon and night because that's what it does. Your brain is like, it's like last year for the pandemic when everything shut here. And like, it was just mad what happened. Like I, the one thing that it bothered me was the cinema. I couldn't go to the cinema. I wanted to go to the cinema. And I was thinking about going to the cinema all the time. I was like, I can't wait for the cinemas to open up. The irony is, is I hadn't been to the cinema for two years prior to the pandemic. But the minute I was told I couldn't go to the cinema, I was like, I can't wait to go there. And I was thinking about it all the time. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. No, I know exactly what you're talking about. When I was at my leanest and uh, I was I got my body fat done and it's crazy. I only I only got down to 9% body fat, which I would have thought I got much lower. But I was deprived myself so much that like, I remember just one night waking up and just eating like loads of chocolate. So it was pretty much like a binge eating like episode. And it was like, yeah, I was going to bed that night being like, geez, I might have diabetes after this, like type two diabetes. Or, you know, I felt like so, I it felt so, I felt like, uh, cause you're so disciplined beforehand. You're like, Oh, I'm doing, you know what I'm doing here is good. Now I'm depriving myself and I'm being restrictive and I'm having like unprocessed foods and really like, food is very natural like you know as in it's just a natural thing you know and to not yeah. have it is unnatural so yeah. like, that's where the, the rigidity of keto and intermittent fasting are so uh, dangerous um yeah and i remember hearing the analogy before from an obesity researcher he said before he's like dieting it's like it's like having a rubber band and the more you diet the more you put pressure on the rubber band and it pulls and pulls and pulls until eventually you can't pull any more and it, more and it breaks or it snaps back Kind of like that coming up for air analogy you had as well. So it's just like, you know, you're kind of setting yourself up for a fall almost because, yeah. you know, it's just so natural that you need it. Like you need it, your body needs it to survive and it will get it one way or another. Um, and yeah. 
yeah, you can have these kind of off limit foods all you want, but like they're around us. Like you can't, you can throw them out of the house, but you can't throw them out of like your environment because you're eventually going to go to a social event. And then I guess that'd be, that'd be like another sign of, of kind of troubling behavior where you're not going socializing as much as you'd like to. Yeah. You know? Mm. Oh, totally. And like, it's so sad. People will spend their whole lives avoiding, um, you know, going to social events, meeting friends or bringing the kids to the cinema or going on date nights or whatever it might be. You can spend your whole life avoiding them because you don't want to gain weight, but yet are, are at home miserable regardless. And it's just so sad that you miss out on making memories and doing things that would actually make you happy. It's just it's incredible. And that's that's the that's what diet culture does to us is that we put everything down to our, what our body looks like, our weight, et cetera. And it's just, it's, it's shackled. Like it's, it literally keeps us shackled, you know? And it's like, a, you know, it's a different world when you push through that. And that's what I meant earlier about like it being life-changing. It is quite literally life-changing because it's not easy. You know, you, one of the questions you asked me was, is there any drawbacks or, or downsides to intuitive eating? Which I think was a really great question because I thought about it for a minute and I thought like, personally from for me was there and I thought no but you know what I know that there is because one of the things that comes through a lot from people is that you know it's so different to dieting you don't get a set of rules you don't get told what to do and like we're humans but we also like certainty and we kind of like to be told what to do or to be told this is what you need to do to get on with this or to do it right and there is no right or wrong there is no falling off a wagon or falling off the intuitive eating journey it's like that's not how it works but I think because it's quite broad and uh, like you know you have to kind of wrap your head around a lot of information in the early stages it can be quite overwhelming and I think a lot of people can revert to dieting at that point because they're like I don't where where do I even start with this you know there's so much I can't even wrap my head around this so I'm not even going to try I need to go back to dieting and that feels that I can feel a bit more in control with when I when I have rules and I know what foods I have to avoid and all the rest of it so I think that is probably a drawback in that, you know, it, 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 you have to have patience, you have to have self-compassion. And they're probably two qualities that a lot of people are lacking nowadays. We tend to not have much patience with ourselves and we certainly are not kind to ourselves. So when you're lacking them two qualities, I think it can make it really challenging in the early stages. But this is what community is around. Like this is what the Instagram page is all about. It's about community, it's support. How do we help one another get through the early stages when it all feels really overwhelming and there's so much information to absorb. And that's what I'm really passionate about because I know when you push through it, it took me months, like it took me months of crying down the phone to my sister going, I don't know if this is really what I need to be doing because I feel like I've gained weight and I'm not weighing myself, but I think my clothes are getting a bit tighter and I don't know if I can do this. And like, she, we, you know, we tease it out and, and we get through it. And like, once you get over that hurdle, it's like the like literally it's the whole other world waiting for you the other side. Like you actually have mental space to live your life. It's like it's just bizarre. Like, you know, for from somebody that wasn't living my life to all of a sudden having like just the mental space to think about other stuff that interests me or things that I want to do with my family or friends or career or, you know, all of that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. I can tell that like you're every bit as passionate about it, as you say, it's almost infectious. Um, and that's, that's very good that you had the support of your sister because yeah, social support, I think it's something that like society at large is lacking, you know, like we're very divided. Um, and you could see as well how not having any framework or template for how to eat food would really disrupt yeah. someone who's coming from the dieting mentality. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of related to the dieting mentality, you have your your operation transformation. Your uh, oh yeah, what what's what's the word I'm looking for? You have the signature. I can't think of it. It slipped my mind. But petition. Uh, petition. There we go. The petition. Yeah. You have the petition yeah. for that. You had nearly five thousand yeah. signatures. So I hope you either have it yet now or you will soon. But do you want to just talk a little bit about that? What led you to getting the petition going? Yeah, for that? yeah, of course. Like so. Um, yeah, it's, 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 you know what, it's a slow burner, to be honest, like 5,000 signatures is, is not actually a whole pile, considering there's a lot of people that know that this is, this program is running for its 15th season. There's no evidence to suggest that it's safe or effective. Last year, I 
just for just to see what one of the like the the participants she would have been probably um in and around maybe my body size I just wanted to see what roughly what calories she was taking in so around 1500 calories so like I mean 1500 calories a day for a menstruating active female when considering you know if you're you know up to a four a four to an eight year old active female uh needs to be on roughly 16 or 1800 calories a day so like how do they sign off on that uh, you know uh, an adult would be on less calories than maybe an eight-year-old would need to be on so it's just a bit bizarre um and it's just you know it's been running for a year on year in year out and it just perpetuates weight stigma we are bringing people in in larger bodies having them dressed in lycra clothing standing on a weighing scale we're, we're giving them really high targets it could be you know four pounds a week and to be honest, that's actually the lower end of it. I watched an episode where some one guy was like congratulated for, I think he lost eight or nine pounds or something in one week, which like we know is significant weight loss. And it's not, we should not be setting them targets. It's really harmful. And then that message is, is headed out to the public and people think that that's normal. And it's not, it's we're normalizing disordered eating behaviors. And like I've spoken to loads of participants at this stage, definitely it must be six or seven that have been on the show and they they don't want to speak out about it because they feel and some so in some way they kind of feel like well they were given the opportunities so they're kind of hesitant to kind of criticize it and nobody wants to i suppose they could go public with it which i totally understand but they have told me that like they all gained weight or they all lost weight initially but most of them gained the weight back and imagine being on a show like that where your whole community gets around you and for the eight weeks you lose three stone and then six or eight months or a year later, you know, you've gained the three stone back plus two more. You feel absolutely shit about yourself. You don't want to go out into your local, your local, you know, area, etc. You don't want to meet your neighbors and your people that were supporting you in your waist loss journey. The shame that people feel is incredible. And like there's no aftercare, nothing. People are just headed off. That's it. Deal with it yourself. And they're still continuing to sell this message that it is like an effective way to lose weight. It's not. It, it absolutely is not. And it's also really uh, trouble, troubling that our Department of Health have funded it nearly €300,000 for this show and for their recent video campaign, paid a hundred grand for the video campaign. I mean, like, you know, a hundred grand could buy people in this in Ireland a lot of therapy that's needed for their relationship with food. And this is where we're pumping the money. I just I can't get over that. We are not we haven't questioned this before now. And, you know, the, the, the reality of it is it's slow to go. It's slow to reach media because, you know, people are maybe hesitant to speak out about it, etc. I contacted like I contacted the, the producer of the show. And he, like he maintained that this show was great and he really was not very interested in what I had to say about it. I sent in lots of research papers highlighting why the show was problematic. I then got on to the commissioning editor of RTE and I spoke with her and I sent her an email uh, outlining the same research and the various points of why the, the show was problematic. And her email reply to me was, we don't view this as a weight loss show which just kind of, it's kind of laughable, but also kind of made me want to cry because like, if this is where we're at, where RTE, like our national broadcaster is denying that operation is, uh, transformation is a weight loss show. And like their logo, their big logo is like an actual weighing scale. Um, you know, where they're weighing people on TV, they've got weight loss targets. It's actually all about weight loss. So like, it's kind of just laughable that that is what she said. So I've now contacted the Minister for Mental Health, who talked about um, prioritising people that are experienced eating disorders this year in the budget, etc. And I do believe she's interested in doing that. So I contacted her and I sent on all the information and I contacted our Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly. And I hope to hear back from him as well. And in the meantime, I'm just trying to get any journalist, anybody that is like, thankfully, I'm going to be on the radio tomorrow. Um, in Cork, they're going to chat to me about it, but it's a bit slow to get to get on air, I think, because there's some hesitancy. It's RTE. And also there's people involved in the show, like the expert panel on this show 
that like, you know, they're good people. They're not bad people. I've no interest or intention of kind of getting anybody quote unquote cancelled or, you know, trying to make out like they're terrible um, professionals, etc. I've zero interest in that because I, I think they're doing their best too in their own way. And but but ultimately, the, if the public has been harmed and if my children are going to be reared in a world where this show is going to be running every January and they might see it places because obviously it won't be out of my house, but they could see it other places. I don't want the message. And, and I know this is this is like this show is like one teeny tiny part of the problem, right? It's not like the whole problem. Even if Operation Transformation was decommissioned in the morning, we're still going to be getting messages that fat is bad and that, you know, your weight determines your health and all of that. We're still going to be getting the messages. But at the very least, we should not have a show like this running every single January, just to, into the new year, just after Christmas, all this reset, lose the Christmas weight bollocks. It's so problematic. Yeah, it's very short sighted. Like it doesn't look at instead of tracking their weight, it doesn't look at, you know, uh, your your mental health, your yeah. your health behaviors, like your activity, um, yeah. your relationship with food. There's no there's no talk of that. Like it's all about the scale. Um, yeah. and even the way they talk, you know, that video that you shared around that initially, how I came across your page, the video where they're talking down to the contestants, multiple contestants and making them feel guilty. Um, and just kind of chastising them for not reaching the targets. And it's just like, how, how many of the contestants decided all I want to do is lose weight and this is the goal I want to aim for? It doesn't seem collaborative at all. It's more just like, it's very like, it's like a dictatorship or something. You know, it's like they're told by these, you know, supposed experts what to do. And if they don't do it, they're bad people is, is what the message I was getting. It's, it's uh, mm. terrible because it looks so dehumanizing you know because they just stand up there in the lycra and they're just yeah you know laid bare to be you know uh absolutely kind of attacked almost yeah for sure like some of them videos were from previous like seasons going back but uh, like ultimately I, I watched some of it last year and th they've just gotten a bit cleverer in their language so like you know it's not i i didn't see as much obvious berating like in the last season as I would have seen in previous seasons so I think it's probably they've gotten a little bit cleverer in that regards because they know that the public don't like to see people treated like that I mean Jesus if some of us in the public don't complain about when that happens there's something seriously wrong but you know then again I'm not surprised because the amount of weight stigma and weight bias like anti-fat attitudes that are in our society is incredible like it's the most, you know, societal, socially acceptable form of oppression is fat oppression. So like, um, you know, the, the reality of it is, is that they've just dressed it up a bit better, a bit more kind of palatable. They talk about it being a lifestyle, but like, you know, again, quote unquote, because it's like you can call it whatever you want. But if you're on 1500 calories a day, you're dieting, uh, you know, and not just you know, a slight calorie deficit, you're seriously like, you know, reducing your calories at 1500 calories. Yeah. And it's definitely going to be hard to see progress initially because you're going against the grain. Like the diet culture is so ingrained in society. Like people just yeah. need to go on this diet, this January diet or whatever. And uh, it's, it's, it's going to take time to turn the tide, but I think you should definitely keep at it and getting on the radio will be great exposure and reaching out to the politicians and stuff like that. Um, yeah, because, I hope so. Oh, yeah, no, it definitely will. It's just, it'll just, you're leading the crusade on your own almost, but like, you know, if then I can do the help or um, if uh, you, you find other people who like the message, which which you will, because it's it's evidence-based, like, you know, as in dieting, we yeah. know isn't effective. Like the stats are very, uh, very scary when you think of how effective diets are, but intuitive yeah. eating um, and just in general, like self-compassion as well, the research, I'm just reading a bit more about that as well, is very yeah. strong um, yeah. and, and very, very clear. So it's like less yeah. of a kind of critical, rigid approach to life and more about like just sort of uh, more like self-compassion and more support for each other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what is the kind of the next plans then? So you're going on the radio and you're, you have the petition. What else are you trying to do with the page? and uh, with, with the work yeah. you're doing like I don't like I don't know where the page is going to go really um you know I'm just going to keep going with that for now but I do have um a little 
we have a little plan for January. It's not going to be Operation Transformation, that's for sure. But we we will hopefully be running. Um, I, I really, not that I can't say much, but it's like an event. But I, I don't know. We The details are, haven't been finalised, but hopefully we'll be looking at um, getting lots of experts in that have. Um, I'm, I'm doing it with uh, a nutritional therapist and intuitive eating counsellor, Neve Orbinski, and she's amazing. And yeah, we're just looking at like getting people that are haze aligned and been able to like speak the truth and share the facts around, as you mentioned, like, you know, health promoting behaviors, like intuitive eating isn't like quitting on your health. I think that's one of the, myth, the main myths of intuitive eating. It's it's actually cares deeply about your health more than any diet ever would. Um, but of course, we know that like, you know, we when it comes to health promoting behaviors, there's loads of things that we can be doing that will benefit our health and that research shows when people engage in health promoting behaviors so like adding in new, like as much nutrient dense foods as possible finding movement that you enjoy getting your sleep hygiene right getting you know reducing stress you like reducing screen time being out in nature social connections there's so much that we can be doing and like your health markers can improve regardless of you if your weight changes or not that is what the research shows us so um yeah, I think the more people begin to talk about the health promoting behaviors, um, it goes back again to trusting the body's wisdom, like our body's wisdom, like our body wants to be at a weight that it's comfortable at. Our body wants to feel energized. Our body wants to be able to move freely. Our body wants to be able to run. You know, that's what we're, we're designed to be able to do that. So, you know, that's, you know, trusting that your body will find its way to a whatever weight that might look for you and that's the thing is that it's not going to be a set weight for it's not it doesn't look there's no one weight it's not a look you know it's and it's not a gene size either like I mean or like if we look across the globe like no two bodies look the same imagine what all the seven billion people there are like us human beings are so wildly different that like no two bodies look the exact same that's the that's the it's just fascinating and you know, that's why it's not it's not one size and we need to come away from this idea that, um, you know, your weight uh, defines your health because that is not true. Yeah, absolutely. It's like one of the, the parts of your health, but it's like ineffective. You're, you're missing the big picture, as you said already. Um, yeah. And that's great that you have an event coming up that uh, will be. Well, it's safe. like a, like well, I said, I don't the detail. detail, but this you're, you're, you have something in the works. So. No, yeah, I mean, I like, I, I hope all goes well. It's like anything; it could be, it could be dependent on COVID actually as well. We don't know what's going to happen, but hopefully, it goes ahead. Um, because we just want to get the information out there to people as many people as possible. So, yeah, fingers crossed. I'll let you know. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, I'll, I'll be keeping an eye out for it, and I love the message of health at every size because, uh, it's very difficult to change your behavior. Don't mind trying to change your weight. Like you know, everyone's tried to change their habits. So if you kind of get away from focusing on one of the harder yeah. ones, which is your weight and you focus on something like your sleep or your screen time or just the low hanging fruit, you know, um, and just kind of accept the body you're in, you know, who knows what change you can make. Um, yeah. Like in research, there's the, like people who are obese, but they're metabolically healthy. And there's a lot of issues yeah. with metabolism, but you can be obese and be metabolically healthy. Um, and of course, if you speak with like a doctor or a health professional, they can figure out like what you can do and, you know, how you can be healthy and live a healthy life and um maybe be mm -hmm. of various different weights across your lifespan so there is no kind of one size fits all for health and that's something that people need to be open to yeah for sure i mean like the, the even the term obese is, is quite problematic and like i don't know if you're aware but it was only in like 2000 i think it was 2013 that the american medical association they brought in like independent epidemiologists to review all of the research around fatness and it's its association with disease uh, and various illnesses or whatever and basically the epidemiologist came back to say that like this was all around should should they classify um being in a certain body weight or uh, put in the category of, like or basically say that obesity is a disease pathologize fatness so they basically um the the epidemiologist basically came back and said that the research didn't back that up, that we should not pathologize an individual's weight based on their BMI, that they're not inherently, they're not ill because they're in a certain body type. Um, and But it was a political vote. They basically voted against it. 
they thought at the time that it was going to help maybe reduce weight stigma, that it would kind of uh, send the message that like, you know, you, you, it's not as simple as controlling your weight and, you know, people shouldn't be blamed for the weight they're in, which absolutely, you know, then points are, are valid. But actually pathologizing people's bodies and, you know, sending the message that just because you're in a certain BMI category and it doesn't mean that you're inherently diseased or ill in any way. Being, you know. So that's really problematic. And a so lot it, of people. It just in- cut out there when you were saying it shouldn't be pathologized, it shouldn't be. Uh- stigmatized the disease of obesity it shouldn't be yeah so way. like yeah so like people in like the you know the the body positivity or the fat liberation movement like they're screaming from the rooftops telling us don't pathologize our bodies just because we're fat doesn't mean you know that we're 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 unhealthy or that we're ill and by by doing that and by giving us that label that in itself is actually perpetuating and contributing to the weight stigma and weight discrimination across the globe. So th- that's why the term obese and obesity isn't one that I personally use without maybe the trigger warning. If I'm trying to have a discussion about, about it, I would, would use that because that's the term that's maybe widely understood at this point, but there, it, it's, it really needs to be reviewed. It's not, it, it's not based on science. Thanks for letting me know because uh, I would have thought uh, it was okay to use, but as in, if, if it's not, then I definitely need to look yeah. into that and research it more myself. That's why these conversations are so useful. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so that's everything for now, Sinead. I think we've covered a lot there. Maybe we could talk again. Um, maybe once you have your event launched or, you know, uh, once you've done more work, uh, is there anything you want to mention or talk about before we, we wrap up that we haven't gone over uh... already? No, I think, look, I think, I hope we've covered some helpful stuff for people maybe at least are curious about what intuitive eating is or health at every size. And, you know, I, I really have to say, since that video went out, like I'm really, I, I'm really um, hopeful about the amount of PTs and people like yourself that have gotten in touch that want to know more about this. Um, because the more, you know, even having an understanding of it or, um, you know, what to watch out for when it comes to your clients, et cetera. I think it's really, it's going to be good for, for everybody to, to, to be doing this work. So thank you for being interested and inviting me on. And it was lovely to chat. No problem at all. It was, it was great chatting to you and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you.